So welcome, thank you for being here. This is our uh, third session and the session today is on high frequency words. I'll go ahead and give you the agenda for today. So today we'll do uh, an icebreaker on getting to know each other. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about what worked well last time. Uh, the essential standard, like I said, is on high frequency words. And then uh, we'll do uh, a modeling, I'll do a modeling of the um, high frequency word game that I brought for you. We'll do a practice, a goal setting, and at the end we'll do a summary, okay? So um, welcome again, my name is Nancy Lopez. I'm the Family Engagement Resource Teacher here for the district. A little bit about myself, I uh, was a classroom teacher for 13 years and then I came on over here to Elk Grove uh, as a resource teacher for family and community engagement. And this is my second year um, doing these, family, uh, these early literacy family workshops. I have two daughters, uh, an adult daughter and then a little one that's four. Okay, so today we are going to talk about high frequency words, palabras de alta frecuencia, okay? So, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and tell you what the high frequency words are. So, the difference between high frequency words and just decodable words is that the high frequency words, uh, children need to look at them and read them as soon as they see them. So, it's automatic. When they see the word, they should know what the word is, okay? So there's no really strategy to how to read these words. So like for example, the word, um, I'll just see, like the word you. The word you, if you show a, a child this, this word, they should be able to look at the word and say you without sounding it out, okay? So without decoding. The difference is because uh, the, a word like for example, cat. If, if you read the word cat, when a child knows the letters and sounds, they're able to actually read each, or say each sound, blend it, and then read the word. So for example, cat would be um, k at cat. So they should be able to do that. That's a decodable word. So these are the high frequency words, and then the decodables are the ones that they can sound out. Okay, so that's the difference. And these, they should be able to, like I said, to look at the word and read the word without having to sound out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways or strategies to help with that because like I said, they can't really sound those words out. They, they just need to memorize them basically is what, um, how they'll learn these words. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's important. So high frequency words are important. That It's important that students know these words because um, like I said earlier, these words you cannot sound out. So they just need to be able to look at them and read the word. When they know these words, the more, wor the more high frequency words they know, the better they will, they'll be faster and more fluent with reading, okay? High frequency words will help them understand sentences better. So instead of, you know, every, stopping at every word, once they pick up these words, they won't have to decode these words. They'll be able just to kind of read, like I said earlier, with fluency. And high frequency words account for 75% of the words that are used in their grade level uh, reading. So in the books that they're reading, if they're at grade level, uh, the words that they're reading, about 75% of those words are going to be high frequency words. So as I've been saying, if the more words they know and the more fluent they are uh, with these words, the better readers they'll be. So what does reading high frequency word, what, do they, what does this look like? So, um, I know last time I brought the little fly swatter where I showed a picture of the fly swatter. Um, so same thing, if you put the words out, I mean you can even use these words and just put them all out and then with the fly swatter have them you know, hit the word as they're reading it. You can also give them the word and say, okay, find the word he and then you know, they have to find the word and then just hit the word with the fly swatter, okay? Here they have post-its, which I love post-its because those are just, um, I mean, you can get those at the dollar um, store and you can write the words that they need help with, okay? Or that they're uh, practicing. This uh, other picture right here, it's just a piece of paper. I mean, you can use a cardboard if you want, a, a thicker piece of paper. But um, here, the, it's a parking lot. So they have little parking lot and then he has a little car and each little parking lot has a word. And so then he has, every time he parks the car into the little parking lot, he has to read the word, okay? And I know from the beginning, I've always talked about movement, that kids need a lot of movement. So the more movement um, and they're learning, it, it just, it sticks with them um, faster. And I think it's just more motivating for them to do it this way than just sitting and practicing with just simple flashcards, okay? If you use just a whiteboard too, like a little whiteboard, it would probably um, help with uh, 
if you, you can erase it, so then you can just switch the words over and over, okay? This one um, is using index cards. So on top, I don't know if you can see this, but on top of the, the card, the high frequency word is written there. So the word like is written on four cards. And then each card has a letter to spell the word, okay? So another thing with high frequency words is that they should be able to spell the word um, and, and be able to, um, when they're writing, they should be able to spell it correctly. Okay, so I know last time I talked about phonetic writing, that it's okay for them to use phonetic writing when they're spelling. But for high frequency words, once they are introduced to the word, they should be able to write it correctly because it's not, like I said, it's not phonetic. So the word like, if they haven't been introduced to the word like, they're probably going to write L-I-K or even L-I-C. But once they, they've been introduced to it, we want to make sure that they're spelling it correctly. So this is just another little way, too, of, of uh, practicing high-frequency words, okay? So today, the, the game that I brought for you today is called Boom. And uh, before I give you the word, the bag, or the game to practice, I'm going to show you what's in the bag. So in your bag, you will get um, the kindergarten high-frequency word list. So this is the um, word list that the curriculum that Elk Grove uses, Wonders. These are the high-frequency words for kindergarten, okay? Um, if you Google high frequency words, you'll find a ton of different lists that are out there. Um, so uh, I would just suggest that if, um, so this is the kinder one. So I would stick to this one and then maybe asking if there's um, first grade words and if you need the first grade words, I have those as well. But um, this is just like a, a simple set that you can use. And then plus these are the ones that your children in kindergarten are gonna be assessed in. So. Um, these are the ones that I would recommend that you start with, okay? So you'll get the, the sheet of the kindergarten, kindergarten high frequency words, uh, the instructions on the game, and then um, I'll talk about this later, but this is just another little resource for, um, for websites, and I'll, I'll share with these in a little bit, okay? So in your bag, you'll have a set of all of the uh, words for kindergarten, okay? So I'll give you all those words. And in the bag, in that set, you also have some cards that are blank, okay? These cards I put in here so that if you lose a card, uh, you can go ahead and write it in. Or if your child is, uh, is using a word that's not on here, then go ahead and write it in. So for example, the word because, kindergartners use it all the time. So it's not on this list, but I would encourage you just to go ahead and write it out so that they, you know, start reading it. Another word that I would always um, uh, that I always think about is in February the kids they would like to write the word love, and so that's another wor word I would just kind of have up and they would practice that word and use that word and then I wanted them to use it correctly so then I would make that a high frequency word okay, um, so if there's words like I said that they're using and they're not on here it's okay to give it to them okay so love because. Um, I'm not sure what others I can think of, but yeah, if, if there's other words, go ahead and, and write them in. So in that same stack too, like I said, you'll have the words, you'll have the blank cards, and then you have these um, other cards that say boom, okay? There's quite a few in here. Um, I think there's about six, five or six uh, boom cards. So the way, one way to play the game, because there's lots of ways you can play is, um, you get your stack of, of cards of uh, the words, and then you include the boom cards in. And you want to kind of shuffle them around. And then um, you can just place the, the stack in the middle, and then everyone will take a turn reading, picking up a card and reading it, okay? So like if they pick a card, they have to say, oh, it's he, and then they keep the card, okay? So then the next uh, person goes. If they, do, if they cannot read the card, the word, then someone else in the group can read the word and then they keep the card, okay? If you happen to pick up the word boom, so if you happen to pick up the word boom, then you have to say boom really loud and then you give up your cards. So uh, in another class, someone said that um, the way they changed it was when they picked up the word boom, they had to do some kind of exercise again, to encourage the movement. So um, they would establish that in the beginning of the ga game. They would say, okay, so when you pick up the word boom, you have to do 10 jumping jacks, okay, instead of giving up your cards. 
or they can pick someone to do that or whatever. It, it's not, you don't have to, you know, stick to one way of the game. So you can do something like that. A couple things I want to share too. Um, if your child uh, doesn't, like, the, like for the three-year-old, um, I don't know if she, she probably doesn't really know any of these words. Um, that's okay. I would encourage that you have her play so that she's being exposed to the words and to just kind of playing around. You can help her. It's fine. Um, if your kinder um, only knows maybe about five words, then start with those five and then just include maybe three or four new words. If your child does not know any of these words, I, I wouldn't put all the cards in there. It would it'll overwhelm them and it, they're not going to feel confident about, you know, trying to read words that they're, they don't know. So I would just maybe start with five cards if, if they're, you know, they don't know any of these words. And they're really, um, I would say there's really no order here. The, the teachers, when they do um, introduce these words, there is an order that they go by. And that order is just according to the decodable book that um, the word is introduced in. Okay, so like we don't go in alphabetical order. It's just whatever book they're reading, whatever words are used in that book, that's how the words are introduced. So um, we'll go ahead and play together the game. Um, I will, um, I'll give you a couple other tips after we play the game, but just so that we can kind of get a little feel for how to play the game. Um, and as we're playing, if you think of any kind of, you know, things like, oh, you know, if, that your child needs help with, then um, go ahead and, and ask me and then I'll, I can help you with coming up with a strategy for that, okay? One quick little strategy that I wanted to um, share with you. Um, when we introduce words to um, children, we don't want to really give them any kind of strategy yet. So we just want to kind of give them the word and see if, if they will learn the word uh, just this way. When they're having a hard time picking up a word, then that's when we want to try and use strategies like a, like a hand movement or some kind of um, gesture when we're introducing the word. So one of the things that I would do with um, students if they were having a hard time reading the word is I would puzzle piece the word. So it's just basically going over the word and outlining the word like a puzzle piece, okay? So for example, here's the word and. You see how it, I go up with, you know, it, it's puzzle piecing the word is what we, we call it. So like the word what, you outline it. When uh, children will uh, make a connection with the shape of the word, when they're reading it, so then that's how they kind of like will learn the word, okay? So that's how that has been helpful. The other thing you can do too is draw little pictures on the cards. So like the word he, you can draw a picture of a little boy, or with the word look, you can draw little eyes to remind them what the word is, okay? Um, same thing with, with, with uh, using hand movements, so for like you, I would always like point. So I would show the word and if they couldn't read it, I would like point and then they would remember, oh, it's you, okay, or me, um, or even I, like I would kind of do this like for I. I mean, I was pretty simple, but you, just doing different little gestures or hand movements help them. Uh, eventually they'll get rid of that and, and they'll memorize the word, okay? So uh, one of the other things too that I wanted to share with you is a couple websites. I know a lot of families will always ask me that, um, you know, that while they're in the car or if they're somewhere and they have access to, you know, their phone or, or to an iPad, um, that they wanted some kind of, of um, websites. So in your bag, you also have that little green sheet that I was telling you. You'll have this little green sheet and the websites will be on here. But I'm going to go ahead and show you um, so that you see what uh, those uh, websites look like, okay? Okay, this is the first one that I um, have on there. It's uh, called AB, it's called Starfall, sorry. This one's called Starfall. So I like this one because it's pretty um, kid friendly. And if you uh, click on, this is just with letters. This one's not high frequency words, but this one's for letters. So for example, if you go to, um, here I'll just do the letter K. 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 Okay, and then do you see how it sparkles? That's so that the children know, the kids know that that's where they're going to click. Anytime it sparkles, that's where they click. Okay, see how that sparkles again? <laughs> I can't get rid So it kind of takes you through um, a couple different pictures and sounds with this one uh, letter. Kitten.
And then here's a sparkle again. Okay. So again, it just it's different words with the, the same sound and the same letter. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this one and go back out to the main page. There's other links on here like learn to read. And this one's also good because it actually gives you, um, this one's more, um, not high frequency words, but uh, more like the Dakota or short, this is a short uh, A, so. Ah, ah, short A makes this kind of sound. Ah, 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 ah. So it's just, you know, a little story for it, so. Zack, Zack. Okay, and then here's a high frequency word. The. Do you see how they didn't sound that one out? Uh, at. Rat. Okay, and then again, it's very kid friendly where they'll tell them where to click, okay? So I'll go ahead and exit out of this one. So this was the first one that's on the green sheet. It's called Starfall. And again, there's a ton of different things on here. Um, there's also themes. So, you know, like the winter theme, uh, 100th day of school, uh, ha like Halloween theme right here. Okay, so the next website is called ABC Ya. And um, this one too, oh, this one has different grades. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on the kinder. And what I really like about this one is that there's a whole bunch of games. So if you scroll down, these are all different games that you can play, um, that your um, children can play with letters. Okay, so these are all different letter uh, games right here. Okay, I mean, it's a, there's a ton of games. I'm going to go ahead and just click on this one right here that's called Alphabet Bingo. Alphabet Bingo. Okay, so then you click on Go. Select a game. And this one lets you choose if you want the sound or the name of the letter. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click on name. Select letter case. And then if you want uppercase or lowercase. So I'm gonna do lowercase. Select a bingo board size. And then the, the, the size of the game piece. I'm gonna go ahead and just do the small one. So on this one, it tells you the letter and they have to click on the letter. So I'm gonna go ahead and repeat the letter. K. So what did they say? K. Good, K, so then here's K. W. Okay, what did they say? W, good. I'm gonna go ahead and click on a, a letter that's not W just so that you see what it does, okay? So I'm just gonna click on B. And it just says try again, that's all. W. And you can always repeat letters so that you can hear it, okay? So they said W. H. And there's a bingo, so they win. Okay, and then you see like how, how they did. So the, here it just says that four were correct, two incorrect, and they got 67%. So just a little detail of that. Um, so those are the, um, a couple of apps. There's a lot of other websites. These are two that I just kind of thought were pretty kid friendly and uh, were good for, you know, kinder first. Um, the other one, the other two apps that are on here, um, these are actual apps to download on, on a phone. The only thing is that these are from the um, App Store, so if you have an Apple or if you have an iPad, these are good to download. I don't think these are on Google Play, so if you have a Google phone, um, it's not gonna work. Um, I just kinda wanted to go over on the Learn Sight Words because that one I just felt was a good one um, and a very simple one. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, show you on my phone what it looks like. Basically, the learn sight word is just like flashcards. And what I like about it is that it just, it's a simple flashcard and it'll tell you what the word is, okay? So for example, like this word. It. And it tells you what the word is, okay? So. C. Okay, and then this is what the screen, um, the beginning of the screen looks, looks like. And so um, this one though, the only thing with this is that the words, like this list is not on a specific, you know, um, uh, box here, but it's still high frequency words. So even if they're just practicing these words, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click on kindergarten. Say. And there's, there's different high frequency words on here. All. Now, one of the things that I do like about this though is there's a little flag on top. So if you, if you touch the flag, it makes it solid. Okay, so all those cards that you, um, if you 
um, touch the little flag, it will save those cards on the one that says flagged words. So if you want to find all these words on here, you can, and then you can find them here, okay? Big, C. Yeah, so that's, two. yeah. So this is just a good one, just so that maybe if they're in the car or if you're waiting at, uh, you know, somewhere that they can go through these. Um, but those two websites that I, um, that I also um, showed you on, on the screen, those are also apps. So you can also download those websites on, a, on your phone, okay? Okay, so this is uh, the part where we do our little goal setting. So thinking on how busy you are and the other homework that they, your children have, about how many times a week do you think you can do this um, game? And just like the other activities, you don't need to do it for 30 minutes. Five minutes is good, just enough time to get them going. Or maybe like your, your youngest daughter, she'll, she'll want to do it all the time, and that's great. <laughs> if they like it, then that's good. So um, good, so three times a week, yeah, that's good. OK, so this is the ending of the workshop, unless you have any other questions. OK, well, thank you. Production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Meet the Author. I'm your host, Emily Godfrey. Joining me in the studio today is author James Ponte, who has written and produced for television. But today, he is here to talk about his framed book series and his Dead City trilogy. James, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, also joining us via Skype are students from Glasgow Middle School. Hello, Glasgow. Hey, Glasgow. Hi, Hi guys. <laughs> are you guys ready? Yes. Smart questions. We're ready. Awesome. We'll come back to you in a moment. So, James, I read that you wrote for kids' TV shows on the Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, and PBS. What made you decide to write for, for teenagers? Well, um, I always enjoyed kids' writing. I loved kids' TV growing up. Um, Nickelodeon, to me, was this ideal culture to be in. So I worked at Nickelodeon for a while. I worked at Disney Channel way back when, probably when you were growing up and watching. I, I wrote the Mickey Mouse Club back oh, really? when Justin Timberlake and Ryan Gosling and Christina wow. Aguilera were just 11-year-olds who would come and annoy me in my office. I should have been nicer to them looking back in retrospect instead of kicking them out all the time. That's yeah. amazing. But yeah, and then, and then PBS doing cartoons like Clifford, Puppy Days, and things like that. And it was just always fun to write for kids. And writing kids' books just was a natural progression from that. Was it a long process? Did you did it take a long time to write that first book? The first book, you mean to get to the point to write it, or yeah. the actual process of writing it? To get to the point of writing it. It was not because it came at an odd time. It just it was not a plan. It was not an expectation. Um, I was a very poor reader growing up, and so what I thought would be that I would write television all the time, and that would be it. And at a certain point, we were an opportunity arose, and. Uh, my wife hates that I tell the story, but it's the honest story. My wife's a high school teacher, and I would say that, you know, if you want honest, if you want support, marry an elementary school teacher. If you want honesty, marry a high school teacher. And so one night my wife's falling asleep, and I said to her, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to write a novel. And my wife just looked at me and said, you should try to read one before you try to write one. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I don't have time. So, and, and, I, and I just, it was an idea one day, and... Four months later, I had a contract for my first book, and away we were going. Wow. Well, our Glasgow students are eagerly awaiting. And I am eagerly waiting to hear what they have to say. To ask you some questions, okay. so let's take a, f a few. Who has the first question for Mr. Ponte? My name is Abdel. Hey, how you doing? Good. What is um, your question? Um, how do you pick your uh, characters? How do I pick the characters? Well, with characters, what you want to do, my, my biggest goal is that 
whoever is reading the book sees in the characters either themselves or their friends or kids they know at school. So what I try to do is I try to think of real, realistic people, based it somewhat on kids that I know, based it somewhat on me and my friends when I was younger, and make sure that they have positive traits, negative traits. But when you're writing a mystery, you need to come up with an excuse for how come this person is solving a mystery. So with, with Florian in these books, what I did is um, his mom works at a museum, his dad is a museum security expert, and so what ends up happening is he gets sucked up into a museum mystery. So that's the reason for why it started. Glasgow students, let's take another question. Hello, my name is Ramsey, and uh, my question is, how did you publish your first book? Um, I, w I worked in television, and I had some time off, and I thought, I have two months without anything to do. That's when I decided I would try to write a book. And so I think if I knew how hard it was supposed to be to write a book, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have thought I could do it. But I just wrote 50 pages of a book, and I just mailed it in, and they said they wanted to publish it. And then later on, I found out it's totally the wrong way to do it, and it, but that, it worked out for me, and that was my first step into it. So um, it, it's not an exciting story. It's just, but all of us have different ways that we get into writing. And every author I know, and I'm really fortunate, I got to know a, a lot of young, middle grade and young adult authors. We all came at it backwards and through weird ways. So Glasgow students, let's have one more question for Mr. Ponty right now. Hi, my name is Kevin. My question is, how do you keep writing when you get stuck? Oh, that Great is a very question. good question. How do you get writing when you get stuck? There's, the term you'll hear a lot is writer's block. And I think what writer's block usually is, or what getting stuck usually is, not the lack of an idea. I think it's usually a lack of confidence in the idea that you have. Because in your mind, you think, oh, I need something really great. And then you read it, it's like, well, that's not really great. So as long as you don't write it down, you still might come up with something great. And that's what sticks you. Um, I, I have a day job during the day, so I write at night. So one of the things that I always have done whenever I have trouble writing, it's probably in the middle of the night, it's like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and a lot of times th the way I'll do it is I will just go outside my house and I'll walk across the street and I'll look at my house and I'll say, okay, you obviously can do this. You, you have a place to live, you have a car, your family's mm -hmm. happy, they're all being fed, so you know how to do this. But more importantly, everyone who's asleep in that house right now is counting on you not to get writer's block. And I just stay there for about a minute or so, and then I walk back, and I start writing. And then I do what everyone should do when they face writer's block, which is I write stuff even if it's not great. Because nothing usually is great when you write it. It's very rare. It's always great when you rewrite it. And you have to have something on the paper to be able to rewrite it. We talk a lot about that with our students, about how you have to get something down first, and that writing really comes in the editing and the revision. Writing, it's rewriting, yeah, over yeah. and over again, absolutely. Well, speaking about writing, um, I read Framed, and I loved it. Thank it was you. Wonderful. That's, that would make it awkward if you didn't, by the <laughs> way. So thank goodness you liked it. Well, I, what I really loved was all the references to places around D.C., like the Foggy Bottom Metro and the Hoover Building and the Art Museum. Um, how do you know so much about D.C.? I, I do tons of research for the books that I write. Um, I like to travel. Um, so I like to go to New York and Washington are my two favorite cities in the country. And so even though I live in Florida, I travel. And so the first book series I wrote was set in New York. The second book series I wrote was set in Washington, D.C. And what I love about it is everything in Washington means something. The White House, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, they're all symbolic of these ideals that we have. So that's kind of a great setting to have a book, as opposed to if I just set it in Orlando where I live, and it's like, oh, there's a bank. You know, here it's, there's the Treasury Building. It's, everything's bigger. Here's a public library. There's the Library of Congress. So I like that. And so I come here. I usually, when I'm working on a book, I'll try to go to the place like two or three times for each book. Uh, sometimes it's really funny. When I was writing the, the Dead City books, they're set in New York, and they're about zombies and dead bodies. And I went with my son, and, there was a, and I want everything to be as realistic as possible. So there is this um, place on Roosevelt Island, which is right there in New York City, where a dead body is discovered. So I had my son lay on the ground like a dead body, and then I walked down the street to see how far away you would be 
to see the dead body. So it's like and real life. So I was doing research, but what yeah. cracked me up is no one in New York cared that there was a body laying and they just kept <laughs> stepping around them or over them and all. And it's just really fun. So I try to go to all the places. I try to arrange special tours. So in Vanish. Well, we have some uh, oh, photos. That's right. right yeah, I, do, I try to do research. And, and so when I'm doing a, a special, like each book in the frame series, takes place at an institution like the Library of Congress, the White House. Mm -hmm. So right here, there's a picture from Vanish. This is the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and that's where the student disappears. That's the title for Vanished. And so I went and I did a tour. I did a tour of that. I went behind the scenes, and it was, it was really great. Well, often the research part of writing is very difficult for students. And it sounds like you really take a real life approach to trying to see the places and get a feel. Do you have any other tips about the research process for kids? I like to go and walk because sometimes that gives me inspiration. It's amazing how good you can research online now. You go and people put up YouTube videos. So you want to find out, well, what's it like to walk? And I do that all the time. I'll go to YouTube or I'll go to Google Maps. Mm -hmm. So in Google Maps, like for instance, in in frame they go to the Romanian embassy and I went there and I took some pictures outside but I forgot their walk to it and they're walking from I think DuPont Circle to the embassy so I just went to Google Maps I got street view and I just walked down the street online to see how far it was to see where there's a donut shop to see where there's uh, you know, here it is and, and you can do it all and so this is actually this is a picture of the Romanian embassy and when I walked by, there's a scene set inside of it. The door, the front door was open, so I thought maybe I can peek inside. Yeah. And, I, and I walked up, and I, and I started asking this man if I could come inside. He saw my camera, and he just started yelling at me in Romanian. <laughs> I thought, I should probably leave here before I create an international incident. So I ran off and, and went and did research elsewhere. But it gave you a lot of good inspiration for that scene. Well, the scene yeah. is maybe not as nice to the Romanian embassy staff as if they had been nice to me, because you got to write what you know, and you got to write what's <laughs> real. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed learning about the toast theory in frame. Okay. Can you explain what toast means? Sure. So toast is the key of these books. Toast stands for the theory of all small things. And it is a technique that Florian Bates is the main character. Florian has invented this as a survival skill. His family moves every couple of years, so he's constantly moving into a new school. And he's learned along the way that people are often one way in big grand motions, but in little ways they're deceitful. So he just looks at the little things to try to figure out who the bully might be or who, where the best place to get pizza might be. And so for him, it's a survival technique. But when he moves to Washington and he meets Margaret, the next door neighbor, a girl from down the street, they start realizing toast can be used for all kinds of stuff and they play games with it. And it's about playing the games of looking at little details and trying to figure out mysteries that they stumble across a big mystery that involves the National Gallery of Art. Well, we have a picture of Napoleon. Would you care to okay. demonstrate, please? Sure. So, okay, so in, in this, what I was doing when I was writing the book, I researched at the National Gallery of Art, and I knew that at one scene, Florian was going to have to explain to, to Margaret how toast worked. And I took a tour, and a woman, took the tour guide gave me the explanation. It was perfect. She showed me this picture. It's Napoleon in his office, um, and... She looked at, she showed us the picture and she said, what time is it? And we look at the clock and I think, he, it, I can't see great from here, but I think on the clock it's 4.13. So we answer, oh, it's 4.13. And she says, right, it's 4.13. But is it 4.13 in the morning, a.m., or 4.13 in the afternoon, p.m.? Oh. And that became the challenge. Yeah. And then you notice the candle is lit. The candle is lit. It's the middle of the night. It's 4.13 a.m. And I realized it was the perfect explanation of toast because you take two little things, the clock and the candle, and you put them together to get the bigger thing. And that's the whole concept of how toast works. Well, do you use toast in your own life? I use it. <laughs> I do use it, but I use it for fun. So I travel a lot, and to to toast was invented at the airport. So I sit around, and I wait for a flight, and you start looking at all the people who are waiting for the flights. Yeah. And, and you just, to pass the time, start trying to figure out, what can I tell about these people without talking to them. What can I tell just by looking at them? And I realized we give away a lot visually. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of look at people's faces and figure out who's related to who. And you can look at what they're carrying and maybe figure out where they're from. And all of a sudden you start painting a picture. And so that's where it came from. But I can't use it to solve mysteries. I can only use it to pass time at the airport. <laughs> Kids always come up to me, they go, toast me, toast me. I'm like, I wish I was that good that I could just do that. So.
Yeah. <laughs> hmm, maybe hmm. next time. Hmm. Sometimes I'll sometimes I'll just make something up. Like a kid will say, "Toast me," and I'll look and I'll say, "You're the youngest of three children," and on the off chance that it's right, they're like. <gasps> <laughs> And, I, and they say, how do you know that? I said, I can't tell you unless you work for the FBI. But I just totally make it up. There's no way to know that. Well, do you have a question for James Ponte? Join the conversation. Jot down the information at the bottom of your screen. We welcome your calls and tweets. The character of Florian Bates might be a literary cousin to the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, and Alex Ryder. These characters are just part of the ingredients for a flavorful mystery. We asked students from Twain Middle School to share their recipe for a good whodunit. Let's see what they have to say. A mystery includes the scene of the crime. A mystery includes suspects. In a mystery, you find clues in the strangest of places. A mystery includes an investigator. In a mystery, there are red herrings, and those are fake clues. In a mystery, secrets are revealed. A mystery includes people who can't be trusted. In a mystery, there's always a place to do research. In a mystery plot line, something's always stolen. I wish I had those twin kids with me when I was writing the first book, because they seemed to know more about it than I knew when I started. But that's a great list. That's a great list. Well, what else would you include in a good mystery? Well, there's a, there's a couple things that are maybe the second level on a mystery. So I think a mystery has to play fair. And by that, it's not, f and I think Sherlock Holmes cheats, and that was the reason toast was important to me. Because Sherlock Holmes knows 294 types of tobacco. Well, mm -hmm. no one knows that. So I wanted Florian and Margaret to only use a skill that anyone could practice and develop. So that's one thing. But all the clues have to be visible in the book. There has to be a way that the reader has a chance to solve it. Because the whole fun of reading a mystery is it's interactive. You're trying to solve yeah. it alongside. So playing fair is one rule. I think mysteries should have an aha moment. And in my books, what I tend to do is the aha moment comes at the end of the first chapter. You go and you build to this, and Florian has this great, ah, that's what it is. And I want to do that so kids reading it, or adults reading it, know that, okay, the key is about something to do with this. And then you go back in time and you build back to it, and that way they know what they're looking for. Again, that's part of playing fair. And then the other part, someone mentioned red herrings, and red herrings are important. But the other thing you need to do is anything that's a real clue, you need to have the opposite of a red herring, which is you need to pay it off in a fake way so people stop thinking of it as a clue. To make and it that's more the surprising. Tricky. Yeah, so make it more surprising. Because otherwise, it's the one thing you haven't mentioned. So if it's important that she's left-handed, you have something else happen that requires someone to be left-handed. And that way, they think, oh, that's why she's left-handed. And they, they mark it into a different line in their head. Well, let's get back to our Glasgow students and take some more of their questions. Glasgow, go ahead. We're ready for you. Hi, my name is Hashar, and what made you write this book, the book frame? When I was growing up, I was not a good reader. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that I would have wanted to read. And that's really, I think a lot of my friends who are writers, that's what they'll say. Stuart Gibbs, I think, says something pretty similar to that. I want to write books that would interest me, and that makes me more interested in writing them. And I love mysteries. I love mystery books. I love mystery shows and movies. And so it just seemed natural to want to do a mystery. Glasgow, um, may we have another question? Uh, what are you going to write next? Like, oh. The next, the ne I have a new series that debuts next year called City Spies. And City Spies is about this British spy who does missions all over the, all over the world. And when he does, he finds kids who have been marginalized. Maybe they're homeless. Maybe they're in foster care. Maybe they're orphaned. And he rescues them and adopts them. And they live in a castle on the coast of Scotland, and he trains them to be spies. So they become British intelligence's secret weapon, this team of five kids who are super spies. And Glasgow, do you have one more question? One more. I'm excited. Did you visit the Library of Congress, and what did you see? I did. For Trap is set in the Library of Congress, and there is a, it is a wonderful place. I recommend a lot of people, I don't think, go to the Library of Congress because they don't think it's for them. It's for everyone, and the treasures there are great. The young, the young readers' room, young person's reading room is amazing. They have all kinds of great books there and great activities. And I arranged through them to take a tour. And I thought I was just going to get to go and see 
I wanted to see the rare books reading room, which you see on the screen right now, and I wanted to see the tunnels that are beneath the Library of Congress because that's key to, this, to the setting. But what ended up happening is the, the head of the rare books reading room gave me a tour of treasures of the Library of Congress. My wife was with me, and she's an American history teacher, and it was amazing. We saw the um, Thomas Jefferson's copy of the Federalist Papers, Abraham Lincoln's Bible, all these things to kind of give us an insight as to the types of treasures that are there so that it could help me in writing it to make it realistic. That's Abraham Lincoln's Bible right there. And um, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. And I think it's a great place to set a mystery because again, a library is something we're all familiar with. Getting trapped underneath the library is kind of terrifying. So we have a few more questions from okay. Glasgow. Okay. Um, Glasgow, would you like to ask another question to Mr. Ponte? Hi, my name is Antonio. If I published a book, what should I do so people can read it? If you published a book, that's a hard question. I don't know how to get people to read it is something that's still elusive to me. I don't know how people decide, I want to do this one, I want to do that. I know sometimes I'll do it by recommendation. I know sometimes that I'll do it by just the cover, even though they say you don't judge a book by a cover, we all kind of do. do that, yeah. But mostly what you do is you just need to tell people. So um, social media is now a big thing that authors use. I have a website, jamesponte.com, and I'll talk about the books there. And hopefully the people will find you. And then if they read one of your books and they like it, then maybe they'll read others. But if you, if you write a book and get it published, send me an email and I'll read it. And then that's one and I'll tell everyone else to read it. So that'd be great. So Glasgow, uh, we have time for another question. Hi, my name is Nelson, and what was the first book that you wrote? The first book, that's a harder question than you think it would be, because I, I, I wrote a book based on the show that I wrote at Nickelodeon, but since that wasn't a fully created from scratch thing, I don't always count that. The first book I count is Dead City, and that was six years ago. Six years ago this week that that came out, yeah. Well, thank you, Glasgow. Um, thank those you, Glasgow. were wonderful questions. If time permits, we might come back to you later. So, James, could you tell me, were you a reader growing up? I was the opposite of a reader. So, I was so slow at it that I was embarrassed by it. Mm. So, I, I, I will tell people sometimes we had this, in my first grade class, we had this um, poster on the wall, had everyone's name on the poster. And every time you read something, you got a star and you go and you put it by your name. And by the end of the year, some of the kids, their, their lines look like, you know, the Hubble telescope took a picture of a galaxy <laughs> and there's just stars everywhere. Yeah. And my line looked like the flag of Texas, the Lone Star State. There was just one star. I, I remember even as a kid putting it in the middle of the line so kids would think my other ones had fallen off and that, that, that may, I wouldn't be as embarrassed that I'd only read one thing. And it was so discouraging that I stopped trying to read and I didn't really try to read for, for years and years. And so I fell behind. A couple books fell through the cracks though, which were vital. So one of them was from the mixed up files of Ms. Baisley Frankweiler. It is my favorite book of all time, even more favorite than the books that I wrote, <laughs> even more favorite than the books that my friends wrote. It is about a girl who runs away from home and with her brother and they live inside the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they sneak around at night. And I remember thinking, that's a real place and that's such an exciting adventure. And I'm sure that's what always made me want to write about a museum, which in framed the museum yeah. as a real key part, yeah. Well, do you have any tips for how students can um, improve their own writing? Sure, there's, there's a lot of ways to improve your writing. So some of the things I'll tell you about writing is first of all, when you write, just write things that matter to you, write about things that matter to you. So if you really care about Legos, write a Lego story. I know if some you, kids who would you, you, totally be into that. If you really that. care about animals, write an animal story. And, and sometimes people think, well, I need to write something important. So they'll leave the things that matter to them, and then the book won't matter as much, or the story won't matter as much. The second thing I would say is, write the way that you talk. I think people try to think, well, I'm gonna use formal words and, and get out of the dictionary and try to use the longest, best descriptions, like, mm. but that's not the way we read. We read the way we talk. So write the way you talk. And then the final thing I would say is, when you write, read it out loud. And hearing your writing out loud is the best technique to make sure it flows, to make sure it sounds right. So that's three starters. And obviously, when your teachers or people tell you you need to rewrite it, they're not just being mean. You really need to keep rewriting and rewriting. 
and and it's great. It's a great thing to do. One of the best things about writing is anyone can do it. Doesn't cost money. Doesn't need special equipment, because everyone has a story to tell, and everyone has a unique voice. So the story that you would tell, you're the only one that can tell it. So you have to be the one to write it. I think a lot of people get hung up on that and they don't remember that their voice is unique. It's great. It's really important. And I think we live in a great time now. I think I might have been a better reader growing up if we had the kind of selection that we have right now. Mm -hmm. So I love it if you read my books and you like my books. But I don't need you to read my books. I just want you to read some books. You know, Lori Hall Sanders is this great author. And Lori, Lori told me one time, she says, James, we're not competitors. We're co-conspirators. All we're trying to do is get kids to read. And if together we can get kids to read, it doesn't matter what they read, there's plenty of kids to go around. And I really believe in that, that philosophy. I feel like as a librarian, can I also say that I'm a co-conspirator with yeah, you Yeah, you absolutely are. And so are teachers and so are parents and so are other kids. And this is really what is important. You know, don't be shy about recommending books to your friends. And don't be shy about, oh, well, that's a graphic novel. That's not a real book. Of course it's a real book. Reading and stories are reading and stories. And, and, you know, graphic novel is another interesting way to tell a story that is special to that creator. So there's so many avenues out there. So we have time for one more question from Glasgow. One more Glasgow. question, can't wait. So Glasgow, what is your question? Hello, my name is Ramsey. Will you write another framed novel? I hope to get to write another framed novel. Books are kind of, series are kind of weird in that you kind of see how, you have to see how popular it is, does it keep keeping interest, and then the publisher decides that they want more. But also, I'm already committed to the next two books that I'm writing. So if I write another framed novel, I'll have to sneak it in sometime next year. Um, but I'm part of an anthology along with Chris Gravenstein and Stuart Gibbs and a bunch of other mystery writers, and we're all writing short mysteries, and that's going to come out either next year or the beginning of the year after that. And that's going to be Florian and Margaret in that. So there's still plenty of Florian and Margaret left to come. Well, thank you, Glasgow. It's been wonderful you to have you awesome. on the show. So, James, could you tell us a little bit about your Dead City trilogy? So Dead City is about a 12-year-old girl named Molly Bigelow. And Molly goes to a science magnet school called MIST, which stands for the Metropolitan Institute of Science and Technology, and it is in New York City. And when she gets there, she's recruited to the secret society called the Omegas, who police the undead that live beneath New York City. And she has no idea, but she has been trained her whole life for this role. And she and, and, and the idea behind the mystery, it's, it's a mystery, it's an action adventure story. Really what I wanted to write about wasn't zombies, which don't really interest me so much, but the idea that growing up you want to know who's real and who's fake. And in this instance, there are real and fake people, because my zombies don't look like the zombies in movies. They look like everyone else. And you have to protect the good ones, and you have to take control of the bad ones. And so that's what that trilogy, trilogy is about. And it was really fun to write. And I was very fortunate that um, some states like Texas and Florida put it on their state reading list. The librarians there got behind it. And all of a sudden, people started finding it. And that made possible Framed and, and the other books that I'm writing now. Is the character of Molly Bigelow based on anyone you know? Molly Bigelow is based on so many girls that I've gotten a chance to meet. So Molly, the whole idea behind Molly is she is this 12-year-old this girl who sees herself as the invisible girl in the back of a classroom that no one's going to notice. And she doesn't know that inside of her is this amazing superhero of a character. And not a superhero with a magic power like in the Marvel Universe, but a superhero in like this brave, smart, daring girl. And she uncovers that. And I meet girls like that all the time. And I just wanted to write a character that made sense to them, that they could relate to. Can you give us the inside scoop? What are you working on now? So uh, I, I slipped up a little bit. I told that a little <laughs> bit earlier. So I'm working right now on City Spies. City Spies is the new series, and I'm very excited about that. And that'll debut fall of next year, um, 2019. And it's these five kids who are part of the secret team for MI6, British Intelligence. And there's a kid from the U.S. and a kid from Brazil and a kid from Australia, a kid from Africa and a kid from Asia. So we have kids from all over the world. And what they've never had before and what they find for the first time here is a family. And they become each other's family. And the, it's full of adventure and it's full of action. A lot of, and full of mystery as well. It's really been fun to write. I'm just finishing the first book, actually. I finished the rewrite this morning before I came in. Well, congratulations. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been wonderful to have you on the show. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to Glasgow and, and the kids who sit in questions and Twain. And it's just really, it's really great to be here. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Glasgow. It's been wonderful to have you Bye. join us today. Bye. Bye. If you would like to learn more about James Ponty, please visit his website. If you'd like to learn more about the Fairfax Network or the show, please visit our website. Go ahead and visit both. <laughs> to learn more about our upcoming programs, please visit the Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Emily Godfrey. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.